Hi, my name is John Lorsch, and I'm the director of the National Institute of General Medical Sciences at the U.S. National Institutes of Health. And today I want to address lab size and talk about the question of whether bigger labs are better labs. So in 1985, Bruce Alberts wrote what I think is a very important and prescient article called Limits to Growth in Biology, Small Science is Good Science. And I think this is a paper that really everyone should read today because it's as important, if not more so, in the current climate than it was in 1985. And Bruce's central thesis was that several factors combine to make large research groups inefficient. And I want to address this question in some detail today. So we can think about this with two extreme cartoons. The first is uh, shown at the top, which is a research ecosystem in which uh, there are a small number of larger research groups. So each of these circles represent a research group, uh, and its size represents the size of that group. And the question we want to ask is, is this an efficient and productive ecosystem? The other e ecosystem is shown at the bottom, and that's one, as you can see, in which there are a larger number of more moderately sized research groups. So again, the question is, which of these two models is a more efficient and productive one? And you can think a priori of a number of reasons that this bottom system, which again is Bruce's thesis, might be a more efficient and more productive system. So, for example, as a research group gets larger, uh, it may become less efficient because less of the PI's bandwidth, their time, their uh, ability to think about things, is available per research project. And you might think that as their bandwidth becomes more and more subdivided, uh, that would eventually uh, be to the detriment of the research going on in the lab. Similar to this, as a lab gets bigger, the PI will have less and less bandwidth to devote per trainee, per graduate student, postdoc, etc. And again, you would think that as this gets over a certain point and their bandwidth is subdivided too much, the training in the lab will suffer and thus the research will also suffer in the lab. Furthermore, as labs get bigger, um, the PI has to spend more time writing grants to keep the lab funded. Bigger labs mean more grants uh, to keep things going, and more of the PI's time will be devoted to writing grants rather than actually, again, thinking about research and training and educating the students. Related to that, the more grants you have, uh, the more time the PI has to spend administering those grants, writing progress reports and doing the other kinds of budgetary things required to keep a number of different grants grow going. And so these uh, factors led Bruce to conclude, and I certainly have to say I agree with him, that a larger research group would be more uh, less efficient and less productive than a smaller research group. There are a couple of other factors, though, that I wanted to also uh, bring up that I think uh, also contribute to this phenomenon. The first is a question of diversity. So now I've colored the different research groups, the circles, according to some uh, different factor. And in this case, it could be the kind of research questions the group uh, is studying, the approaches they're taking to study those questions, uh, or maybe the model organisms they're using to address those questions. It could also be the region of the country in which the research is being done, the institution type, or the background of the researchers themselves, with some uh, metric of diversity of research. And what you can see very clearly is that having a smaller number of large research groups versus a larger number of more moderately sized ones leads to less diversity in this ecosystem and more diversity in this ecosystem. And so because diversity uh, in all of its different forms has been shown in a variety of ways to lead to strength, increased productivity, more efficiency, more creativity, one might conclude that having a more diverse research ecosystem would be better than having a less diverse one. Now, related to this uh, is the question of chances for discoveries or breakthroughs. Discovery is an inherently unpredictable process. Discoveries and breakthroughs come out of all sorts of unexpected places. People studying strange and unusual systems, asking uh, maybe innovative questions that other people haven't asked before. Uh, and therefore, one might conclude that having more chances, that is more research groups studying a wider variety of different things might improve the chances for discoveries and breakthroughs. Uh, and that is certainly something I would think would be true. And if you haven't figured it out, these uh, red starbursts are supposed to be fireworks coming out of uh, discoveries from certain labs or indicating discoveries that took place in certain labs, more in the case of a more diverse ecosystem and fewer in the case of the less diverse ecosystem. 
So what do all these things add up to? Well, what they add up to, uh, I think, is that having a broad and diverse um, portfolio will maximize the return on the taxpayers' investments. That is, having more research groups funded doing more different kinds of research will lead to better returns because of increased productivity, increased chances for breakthroughs, and increased efficiency. Now, those things all make sense a priori, but being scientists, we might ask, are there any data to support those uh, conclusions? And it turns out that there are. And over the last um, five years or so, an increasing number of studies have come out using a variety of different metrics, looking at a variety of different research systems and funding agencies that all come to the conclusion that research productivity and impact don't scale proportionally with funding or lab size over a certain threshold. And so one example of that is shown here. This was a study done in uh, about five years ago, um, in 2010, at NIGMS, uh, in research led by Jeremy Berg when he was director of the institute. And what this shows is the productivity, in this case measured in the red line by publications from investigators during the time of their grant period, as a function of their NIH funding. So this is the funding that NIGMS investigators got from NIH as a whole. The blue line shows a different metric, which is the average impact factor of the journals in which those papers were published in each of the direct cost bins. And obviously, impact factor is a fairly flawed metric to measure scientific impact. But in this case, what they were trying to look at is the claim by some that as research groups got bigger, uh, they would be doing more important research and therefore publishing in fancier journals. And that can be measured by the impact factor. Uh, and that's why they were looking at this in this case. Now, if we focus on the publications metric, the red line, what you can see is that going from zero direct costs to some fairly modest amount, say $200,000 to $300,000 per year in direct costs, leads to a very rapid rise in productivity. And I've uh, drawn a black dotted line through the data to sort of guide your eye through this. That's not very surprising, because if you have no money, it's rather hard to do much research. What really was striking about these data, however, is that once one goes over, say, 300,000 or so in direct cost, although productivity does increase, it doesn't increase very rapidly. That is, there's a very shallow slope to this line here, uh, indicating diminishing returns as a function of funding levels. In fact, once one gets out to the fairly high funding levels, they actually saw a decrease in net productivity um, as a function of funding. So these data indicate that there are diminished marginal returns as a function of funding over a certain direct cost threshold. So I'm frequently faced uh, with situations where I have to make hard choices. Uh, as, as an institute, we have to decide between funding one grant and another because there is a fixed budget we have for supporting research. So let me just do a back of the envelope calculation to show you how we as investors of the taxpayer money think about uh, these kinds of data. So frequently, I'm faced with uh, this either-or situation. We have two grant applications that have come in. One is for a, an R01 to um, an established investigator. It would be his third R01. He already has two. The other, uh, shown here at the bottom, is to a new investigator, and it would be her first R01. Both of these scored well. Let's say the first one to the established investigator got a score of a fifth percentile, and the bottom one to the new investigator got a score of, say, 15th percentile. Both well, uh, but maybe this one did a little bit better. Now, if we give a third grant to the established PI, we will take him from 400,000 in direct cost, so somewhere over here, to 600,000 in direct cost, say, somewhere over here. And if you look at the graph, you'll see that on average, that will buy the taxpayers one extra paper in this grant period time. In contrast, if we give a new grant to the young PI, we'll take her from way over here, zero, uh, to about $200,000 in direct cost. And that, if you look at the graph, will buy the taxpayers, on average, about five papers in that grant period. And so it's not very hard to see that, uh, on average, we're going to buy the taxpayers four additional papers by taking uh, the 
grant for the young investigator rather than giving a third grant to the established investigator. Now there's lots of caveats here. Some research is more expensive than others. If you look at these bars here, they show the interquartile ranges uh, on the data. So you can see there's a lot of variation. And of course, some investigators really can use more money more efficiently. But by the same token, that means that there are also investigators who are, by definition, being funded, because we're only looking at funded investigators here, who do worse than the averages, okay? And so as investors, we really need to think in general about the overall uh, situation and what's best for the entire ecosystem. Now, you might say, well, that's just NIGMS. Uh, maybe it's something unique to funding uh, the kind of science you fund. But it turns out, as I mentioned, that many other studies have been done over the last few years in other NIH-funded institute or other NIH institutes funding different kinds of science, um, other funding agencies, and even other countries that all come to the same conclusion. And so here's an example of a study done recently in the National Institute of Mental Health research portfolio. That's this first paper shown down here. And instead of looking at papers as their metric, they were looking at normalized citation impact per million dollars of funding. Citation impact is the number of citations that uh, were generated by the papers published um, by the researchers in those groups, normalized for field, for journal, uh, for, for type of journal article, and also for year of publication. And what you can see is that the normalized citation impact diminishes as a function of total grant award until some amount where it plateaus at a lower level. Again, showing quite clearly diminishing returns as a function of funding. And a number of other studies recently have shown this same kind of phenomenon with other NIH institutes um, as well. Now, everything I've shown you so far has to do with funding as uh, the metric. And of course, funding is related to group size, although there are caveats, such as some research is more expensive than other research. So what about group size itself as a metric? Uh, and it turns out very recently, a very interesting study was done in the life sciences research system in the United Kingdom. And it looked at actually group size and a variety of different metrics of productivity and impact. What I'm showing here is citations as a function of group size. And you can see that uh, they vary basically uh, hardly at all. It's basically a flat line with a very shallow slope over this, um, this metric here. And so that's also consistent with diminishing marginal returns, in this case, as a function directly of group size. So what do these data indicate to us? Well, I think they indicate to us that Bruce Alberts' uh, logic was correct. And in fact, having a more diverse research ecosystem with a larger number of more moderately sized research groups is going to be more productive, more efficient, and ultimately more impactful than having the less diverse ecosystem of larger research groups. So what can we do as a research community? Um, there are a number of things I think we should think about. The first is to disentangle group size and budget size, that is number of grants, from conceptions that we have of PI success. So we need to think about success as the science that's done rather than how big your group is or how many grants you have. We also, I think, all need to renew our focus on efficiency as one of the important goals of what we're doing in the system in addition to productivity and impact, getting the taxpayers the most for their investments. And I think that's really something critical that we need to uh, devote ourselves to. At NIGMS, we are trying to do this in a number of different ways. In fact, we just released our strategic plan for the next five years. And the very first objective is to invest in and sustain a broad and diverse research portfolio uh, of highly meritorious work, of course. Um, and we have a variety, if you go to the strategic plan, a variety of different ways of trying to get to that. One of which is to uh, test a new grant funding mechanism in which we will give a single grant per PI. It's called Maximizing Investigators Research Award, or MIRA. Uh, and among the many positive outcomes we hope that MIRA will have will be to allow us to support a broad, a more broad, and a more diverse research portfolio for all the reasons I just explained. If you'd like to read more about these ideas, I recently published a commentary in Molecular Biology of the Cell, and the citation is shown here, that talks about them and also goes into somewhat uh, more detail than we did here. Finally, thank you very much for watching, and I hope to be back again soon.